I've been given a little while to talk to you, and I just want to tell you the perspective I'm going to bring to this. So um, I grew up in Arkansas in the 1950s. Uh, all my friends' fathers had fought in World War II, and it was a draft era. So if you went to the University of Arkansas, you were going to be in the military. And um, you had to do two years ROTC compulsory. And um, people were proud of the armed forces. And Eisenhower was president, and he represented the armed forces um, and the country. And we were proud of Ike. And we were also a nation under threat. So I was in the eighth grade when Sputnik was launched. And I remember the outcry and the fear. And um, those of us on the swimming team in junior high school were talking about what could we do to help. And so we, um, we formed a, a rocket club. And uh, like maybe 100,000 other young kids across America, I learned my chemistry by trying to build rockets and rocket fuel. So you could go to the drugstore, and um, you could buy a pound of potassium nitride and a pound of sulfur, and you could mix it up with the charcoal from the, you pounded from the backyard barbecue grill. And, um, and then one of my uh, friends said, well, you know, potassium nitrate, it has an extra oxygen molecule, and so you should use nitrate rather than nitride. And so that's the way we learned our chemistry, and it was about national security. When I was 14, uh, Nikita Khrushchev went to a farm in Iowa and he was a Soviet premier, and he said, we communists will bury you. Uh, this was pretty upsetting if you lived in Arkansas because you didn't want to be buried by a communist. In 1961, uh, Khrushchev went to the United Nations and he took off his shoe and he pounded on the podium. And um, there was a crisis in Berlin and the Allied forces had been denied access. John F. Kennedy had run for president on the missile gap. And America felt that it was under threat. So I wanted to help my country. I went to West Point, and I did my four years here, um, and it was a great education. They told me it was going to be like Harvard in the social sciences and MIT in the sciences. But uh, So I went there to be a theoretical physicist, I thought, and then I went to I studied Russia and went to Russia for uh, summer for, for 10 days in the summer of 1964. And, um, so I was fluent in Russian, and I could argue with the Russians, and I realized that it was the future really wasn't about theoretical physics at that point. It was really about the Cold War and about relations with the Soviet Union. And uh, so I switched my field of concentration. I went to Vietnam in 1969. I was a company commander, infantry mechanized, um, down in uh, the Saigon area. Got shot, came home on a stretcher. And, um, and I uh, thought about my life, and I thought there was really nothing that was going to be more interesting than helping the United States deal with the challenges of the Soviet Union and the international environment. So I, I had a great Army career. I taught at West Point. I commanded a battalion and brigade. I commanded 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood, you know, with the yellow shield and the horse on it. <clears throat> I did the National Training Center and the Battle Command training program, training and evaluating our leaders and our forces. Um, and I ended up um, then as the deputy, uh, as the, uh, as the uh, strategic um, plans and policy chief for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, meaning that I was um, the three-star general in charge of um, working with the State Department and the White House on all matters of national policy. And then I did the the Dayton peace talks with Richard Holbrook. And um, then I became the commander in chief of U.S. forces in the U.S. Southern Command. So I was responsible for everything south of Mexico, including the Caribbean. And then I was the NATO Supreme Allied Commander. And I had to enforce the Dayton peace talks. And um, we also did a big military operation there called um, Operation Allied Force. So I retired in 2000. I was 55 years old. And uh, I didn't know what to do. And um, I ended up with a, a, a headhunter who said, since you don't know what to do, you should become an investment banker. Because um, that's broad, and uh, there's a lot of variety. And uh, so I interviewed with Goldman Sachs, and I interviewed with Merrill Lynch, and, and I ended up uh, going to Arkansas. And um, 
because they had an investment bank there. And I went back uh, to where I grew up. And uh, so I've been there uh, as a home ever since. I left the investment bank. I, one of these guys who I couldn't keep my mouth shut. And I, after 9-11, I was on TV with CNN virtually every day. And it was a little scary at first because I didn't have an intelligence officer there telling me what I could say. And I didn't have a Pentagon PR guy there telling me what I couldn't say. And um, I was on my own. And I began to nose around Washington and I realized um, this pressure to go to war with Iraq, it was, it was hokey. There wasn't any reason to do this. I'd seen all the classified material on Iraq when I was at AO Commander because we were bombing it. And uh, through Turkey, we were flying over Iraq, and whenever they turned on a radar, we bombed. This is 1998-99. And so um, I knew what was going on, and I saw this, and I wrote a couple of op-eds and began to speak out. And before I knew it, um, I had 20,000 people online demanding I run to be president. And um, so um, I entered the political race, and I declared I was a Democrat. I, I've been in the Ford administration, actually, as a White House fellow in the mid-'70s, and so most of my friends were actually Republicans. Um, and I became a Democrat because I knew the war in Iraq was a mistake. And um, so I had five glorious months. <laughs> I got tutored in economics by Bob Rubin, and um, I had the best people telling me about health care. And um, it gave me a chance. To, I went to 30 states in 90 days. We raised $25 million or so. And it was a great experience to meet Americans and see the world through the lens of politics. Uh, and then I went back into the business community. And I've been with maybe 100, 120 businesses. I've been with some of the top businesses. I was a, with Goldman Sachs private equity for four years, Clayton Duvalier and Rice, so I know the private equity business. Um, I've been mostly working in energy, so I've worked in wind, solar, electric power, um, ethanol, biofuels, um, and I've been in the other side of energy. I've been with oil and gas. I've worked in China, the Middle East, Africa, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and South America, and Canada. So um, I've seen a lot, and um, I'm in the stage of life where I'm sort of giving back now. I'm trying to give back. And I want to share some of these insights and experiences with you. I asked, I asked Sarah, what should I talk about? And uh, she said, well, anything you want, really. And it uh, reminded me of the story when I was uh, working for General Alexander Haig when he was the Supreme Allied Commander. He'd worked for Henry Kissinger in the White House. And he told me the time that he, Kissinger called him in and he said, Hey, what are you doing to me? He said, I've got to give a speech, and I, you've given me 10 minutes to prepare. I, 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 don't know, I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. I've got three crises going on. What are you doing to me? And Haig said to him, he said, Henry, just, just tell him everything you know. It won't take 10 minutes. And he said, Haig, I'll tell him everything we both know, and it won't take a minute longer. So um, I'm going to try not to tell you everything I know, but I do want to talk about this issue of the climate, what the challenges are, and what the opportunities are. And I'm very mindful of what Jeff Bridges had to say up there. He talked about the importance of each individual. He talked about optimism. He talked about the future. He talked about how we can make the adaptations we need. I agree with all that. But, but, I want you to see the facts as they appear to me. I'm a national security guy. That's what I've spent my life working on, trying to protect America, the Constitution, the way we live, and, um, and our futures for our children and grandchildren. So I want to go through some facts here and lay out these facts. I know you all are interested in this. I know you're committed to it. But sometimes it helps just to go back to the basics. So bear with me while I go through some of these basics. As, as Sarah said, we've got a lot of interest now out there. These are just three of the recent climate books that are available for you to read that will shock you and frighten you. 
And um, these are just, uh, there, there's dozens of them that are coming out. This is a crisis in climate change. I don't know if there's a national emergency on the southern border, but I can tell you there's a national emergency with climate change. All right, it's not moving. Let's move back. I want to talk about the data, the consequences, and the opportunities. And I want you to go through this. I want you to think about this. This is the greatest economic opportunity in mankind's history. It's the greatest. It's a pressing need that we have all, almost all the tools and all the financial resources and all the institutions that could solve this problem. It's the kind of challenge that could bring mankind together in a way we've never been brought together before. So I'm going to show you some frightening statistics, but I want you to have underneath the knowledge that it's a problem that is, um, we can deal with it. We may not be able to totally resolve it, but we can deal with it. So let's look at the facts. I don't know why this takes so long to, to change. Am I doing this wrong? I'm pushing, okay. So look, look, I want you to look at the annual average rise in temperature. The left-hand chart, 1880. The right-hand side is 2020. And um, what you see is in the last decade, the temperature is going steadily up and at an astonishing rate. Now, these are just the facts. That's a 2017 average. It shows 0.9 degrees centigrade higher than the pre-industrial age atmosphere. And 17 of the 18 warmest years in the last 136 have occurred since 2001. So it's not a linear function. It's more than a linear function. The scientists can't quite model it and predict it accurately yet. But what we do see is the evidence. If you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if you burn fossil fuels, if you use energy from the earth the way we've been using it, the temperature is going to go up. And here's why we say it has to do with carbon dioxide. If you look at the historic levels of carbon dioxide, and this is on the left is 400,000 years ago, and on the right is today. And you can see that sharp orange line going up on the right of the chart. The last time atmospheric carbon dioxide amounts were this high was three million years ago, when the temperature was about five degrees Fahrenheit higher than it was today, and the sea level was 50 or 80 feet higher than today. With 400 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, there's never been a Greenland ice cap. So at that level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, Greenland is going to be ice free. It's just a question of how soon. So this shows the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere going back to the 1970s through 2017. And what it shows is that the concentration is going up, but it's also going up with increasing uh, intensity each year. So we went up by three and a half parts per million. They measure it in parts per million. We went up to three, by three and a half parts per million in the latest data we've got here, which is 2015 to 2016. And we're averaging, uh, uh, the last year, the last cumulative data was 408 parts per million. Changes seasonally, the northern hemisphere, uh, southern hemisphere are a little bit different and there's a plant um, expiration and other things that change the amount of CO2, but as a mean, 
uh, you can see what's happening to us. Uh, CO2 is a greenhouse gas that reflects infrared radiation back to the Earth. So when the sun shines on the Earth, and the radiation would be reflected into space, that CO2 holds that heat in the atmosphere. And what you see in this chart is who's doing the emissions of the CO2. And so if you look at the purple, that's India. The lime green that's sort of leveling off and even slightly going down through 2017 is the United States. We're giving out a lot of CO2. That's, uh, that's over four uh, billion tons per year. But China's giving out 10 billion tons per year. And everybody else is 15. And this is economic development. When countries develop economically, they use energy. And the energy they're using is coal. I was in Ghana in 2013. A guy came up and he said, oh, you're General Clark. I said, uh, yeah. He said, uh, I said, where are you from? He said, South Africa. I said, what are you doing in Ghana? He said, we're putting in a power plant. I said, really, what kind of power plant? He said, coal-fired power plant. I said, really, where are you getting the coal? He said, from you. It comes from the United States. So when countries develop, they need energy, and when they need energy, they turn to carbon. And that's the consequence. So if you um, look at if you look at where it's coming from, what's the source of it? What you see at the bottom is, is coal. In black is orange. You see natural gas in blue. And you see at the top a sort of yellowish. When you turn over the soil, you expose microbes, and those microbes release carbon dioxide. And so just by increasing the amount of land under cultivation, like when you're taking down a rainforest in the Amazon, or in Africa, you're causing um, an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. So you're causing an increase in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yellow is the land use change. Gas is blue, oil black. Coal is the orange. And I'm trying to get the slide to move forward. I'm going to try it again. So if you say, well, it's going to be better in the future, actually, it doesn't look that way. So here's the U.S. Energy Information Agency's projection for future energy use. And this is running through 2040. And I acknowledge all the good things that Sarah had to say about cities that are saying they're going to use renewable energy. But this is the um, 2015 20, this is actually the energy outlook from 2017, which has the 2015 data in it. And what it shows is that petroleum demand grows, natural gas demand grows, the demand for coal is still high and level, and yes, we are doing more with renewables, nuclear is there, but that's not going to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That's going to put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And when it goes in the atmosphere, it stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. We're using more energy projected by 2040, so we'll be using almost 50% more energy, and uh, a lot of that additional energy is going to come from renewables, but a lot of it is going to come from carbon. Some people believe that it's the, really it's not caused by human beings and our activity. They believe it's, it's natural, it's the sun. So uh, for your friends who are still climate change skeptics, uh, all of the scientific data shows that the changes in temperature and energy from the sun cannot account for more than 10% of the changes on these charts of temperature rise and energy absorbed. Uh, by the atmosphere. So the sun is actually not to blame. Now look, this is not the only crisis we face. 
so there's a lot of other challenges out there for us to think about so i'm looking sort of trying to project thirty years in the future there's no there's no cold war today we're not going to be um, back in a cold war with china or russia i think the chance of a shooting war is it's always possible if things are mishandled if you have the wrong people in leadership positions uh, maybe you could get in a shooting war but the countries are so economically interdependent and the survival of the leadership let's take china for example and uh, in he's got to produce jobs if he gets in a conflict with the united states chinese president xi jinping his economy will collapse and when his economy starts to collapse and tens of millions of people have no jobs he got a crisis at home so he does not want that and uh, the same with Putin. He, he wants to sell oil, and he wants his Soviet Union back, but he does not want to destroy the economy of the West where his money is stored. Some people say Putin's worth as much as $200 billion, and you can be sure it's not in Russian banks. So we do have some other challenges out there. We've got terrorism. All it takes is a couple of airplanes shot down and you would see a huge drop in economic activity. We've got a cyber challenge because we invented the internet. We're the nation most dependent on it. We're not supervising it effectively with the, um, with the internet service providers. The people that lay the backbone um, are doing it on the basis of what's cost efficient, what gives the greatest data rates, and what has the lowest latency. President Trump rejected a recommendation from the FCC that Obama's people had put forward that said you have to design 5G for security. So he threw that out. It's not designed for security. Now we've got a big fight going on internationally that you've probably seen with Huawei. Um, and we're pretty sure that if you buy Huawei Chinese equipment that the Chinese have a back door to it. Um, that's probably because we're pretty sure if you bought our equipment, we would put a back door in it also. So we don't want anybody buying Huawei equipment. Uh, but it's too late for that because that Huawei equipment's already all over the world. And uh, we failed to design for security. So cyber is still out there as a major challenge for us. The financial system, of course, we all went through 2008, 2009. It was pretty unpleasant. And um, we put forward some legislation to fix it, but we put forward the legislation to fix it before we'd actually done the study of what caused the problem. And now many of those restrictions on banks are being peeled back. So we still have trading in derivatives. It's uh, not, uh, we don't know what it is. There's hundreds of trillions of dollars, maybe 600, maybe 800 trillions of dollars of, of derivatives on currency exchanges that can't be covered. So when you're looking at the European Union and you're seeing the headlines about Brexit or the Italian crisis, you have to understand that those changes, those shocks over there could be transmitted through the whole financial system. So we've got a lot of people worried about it, but it is about politics as well as economics, and it is a challenge. China does want to be the largest power, greatest power in the world. They want to be the center of human civilization. That's where they've always been before. This is the China dream. Um, and so how we bring China forward into our global institutions is a, it's a huge challenge for us. And right now we've got a trade dispute with China. It's probably long overdue. They've taken our technology for years. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we've had businesses rush over there and offer their technology. So we've got to get the balance right of cooperation with China, work with China, and competition with China. And then there's climate change. And there's crises. There's Syria, Yemen, North Korea, Ukraine. But if you underscore all of that, what you see in all these crises is you can't fix them with government action alone. It takes the private sector and government. You can't fix them with some magic invention. You can't fix them with one nation operating by itself. And you can't fix them without investment. They all take resources. And so we don't have a Cold War. We don't have 
um, the sense of imminent doom that we had back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, you don't see any ban the bomb movements out there. You don't see people protesting it today. But we do have these challenges and these crises on the horizon. And we have to work these. If you look at climate change, for example, this is a computer simulation of the jet stream. And there's your polar vortex that's bedeviling the East Coast again this, uh, this year. And you can see what used to be a circular jet stream has been completely distorted by the rising temperatures in the northern Pacific and, um, and in the Arctic. And here's just a reminder that um, France is not protected any more than the United States or any other country. This is the flooding of the Seine River in Paris in 2016. And, of course, as the water heats up, the corals die. This is uh, some dying corals and some dead zones in Indonesia. The oceans are more acidic. Um, streets flood. This is Houston, August of 2017, Interstate 45. Here's a projection of the impact of 20-foot sea level rises. So if you look um, on the uh, left-hand side, you'll see the United States. It's, it's Louisiana, all South Louisiana gone. Um, no more LSU football teams. We like that in Arkansas, but the rest of it's pretty bad. You look, if you had a, a nice vacation home in Miami, it's gone. If you look at the eastern seaboard, all my Army friends who retire and buy those wonderful homes down on the Virginia and North Carolina coastline, they're gone. And um, across the Atlantic, the Benelux countries and the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike, that's gone. So that's a 20-foot rise in sea level. That's beyond the most dire projections right now from the climate predictors. But what kind of worries me about this is that every four years when we get a new climate report, the predictions are always wrong. They've always gone too conservative. They've never understood the feedback mechanisms that continue to aggravate the situation. So right now we're calling it worst case, maybe a 12 foot rise in sea level. This looks beyond the worst case, but who knows really? I first learned about climate change in South America when I was the commander down there and we flew down the west coast of South America, we looked at these glaciers that were marked on the map. You know, the Andes is only like two mountains wide. It's not like the Rockies. And some of the peaks are 17, 18,000 feet, 19,000 feet. They've got glaciers on them. At least that's what it shows on the map. But some of them didn't have any glaciers left. Here's a picture of a glacier in Patagonia, the Uppsala Gate Glacier. So if you look at the top, you can see the glacier from 1928. And if you look at the bottom, you can see a lake there in 2016. It's not coming back anytime soon. Now, if you look at the worst case on warming for New York City, this is, um, this is Manhattan. I don't have a pointer. So in the center, you can see a slight strip of white left in Manhattan. That's worst case in the current projections for the year 2100. In other words, you're going to have a huge seawall around Manhattan if you like Wall Street. And if you like the meatpacking district, uh, you better protect it because you're going to need about uh, maybe 15 to 20 feet of high wall around the island. Otherwise, you won't have it. Even under the best case right here, you're losing most of uh, you're losing Wall Street, the lower east side, and some of the west side in Manhattan. And that's the best case. This doesn't account for storm tides. So I was in Manhattan during the Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and I can tell you that it was a disaster in Manhattan. Never seen two million people walking north before, but that's what they were doing because there was no electricity for days in lower Manhattan. So that's coming. We're dealing with an unprecedented rate of change, and 
potentially catastrophic impact. So I just want to make sure that everybody in the choir out here who applauded when I said it was a national emergency, okay, now we got the data right. So this is the data. And it is potentially catastrophic. We don't want to live with this. We have to do something. We have to do something. We don't want to live with this. Why has it continued? Why haven't we done something before? Scale, competing interests, distraction, and technologies. Let's take a look at it. First of all, you realize there's like two billion cars in the world. Two billion are out there, are going to be out there by 2040. So in the United States, we're buying 16 million cars a year. The average car lasts 19 years. So you're giving a $7,000 rebate to buy an electric car. But people are not going to buy a car. They're going to keep the car for 19 years on average. I'm driving a, let's see, I'm driving a 19-year-old Mercedes and a 26-year-old Mazda Miata. And, and they're both doing great. We engineered them to last forever. And it's hard to get rid of old cars. So if you want to get rid of, um, of, of, of transportation that's running on carbon, you've got to replace maybe 2 billion cars by the time you get there. We're producing 16 million a year. China's up around 20 million a year now. That's a lot of years to get this off the road. The same thing with trucks. There's close to a, there, there, there's over 500 million heavy diesel trucks on the road. And you've got uh, air revenue is, is uh, it, it's in the trillions of dollars. It's the lifeblood of modern commerce. You can't stop it. And airplanes are probably going to be the last um, of the conveyances to go electric because the specific energy in jet fuel is much higher per pound than you can put into a battery. So they're tough. So you've got a problem of scale. You've got a problem of competing interests. Look, in blue on this left-hand pie chart, that's the uh, oil reserves that belong to OPEC. And if you ask at $80 oil, which is what we've been flirting with for the last year, what's the most valuable thing in the world? The most valuable thing, it's oil reserves in the ground. It's worth more than the GDP of the United States, more than the stock market, more than the stock markets of all the Western countries. It's oil in the ground. And the people that have that oil, they want it to be used. And they are, whatever you hear about Saudi Arabia saying they're going to, you know, have moved beyond a petrol-based economy, yeah, yeah. But they're going to move at their pace, and they need those petrodollars to get there. And our friend Vladimir Putin, look, we export, we do export some petroleum products. But if you look at this bright green, you see how much more Russia exports. It's more than 50 percent of all of their exports. And when you add the natural gas to it, it's more than two-thirds of Russian exports. The rest of it are various forms of weapons and other technologies. And then there's the competing interests. So you may remember we almost uh, voted in a cap-and-trade system in the United States in 2009. It was ultimately defeated <clears throat> in the Senate. Here's one of the reasons it was dis defeated because those very good energy companies, including companies like Excel, um, they spent over a billion dollars lobbying to make sure there wasn't a cap and trade system. I was recently in a symposium in Atlanta and Southern Energy presented its plans. And of course, this was a renewable energy symposium. So Southern Corporation was, you know, very forthcoming and we love solar, we're doing wind and we're taking all kinds of technology measures and it 
it was pretty optimistic. <clears throat> Someone asked the man who was presenting, said, actually, um, but what percent of your generating capacity right now is renewable? He said, well, by 2020, he said, 2% will be renewable. So it just shows you we've got a long way to go. There are huge financial equities tied up in the existing energy system. Bonds, banks, public utility um, commissions, and tens of hundreds of thousands of people, and they make their living off the current system. So when you bring in green energy, you are a threat to this system. Then there's all the internal distractions, international crises, social media, daily life. You're not reading about climate change every day in the newspaper. It's there every single day, but you have to really search to find it. You can find Yemen on the front page. You can find Brexit. You can find an angry discussion between Angela Merkel and Vice President Pence. But you have to really search to realize each day we're putting out maybe a billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere. We're still not quite there on technology. The batteries are still too expensive. Solar has come down enormously in price. So batteries were, used to be, here's a measure, so it used to be like $400 per kilowatt hour of electricity stored. So that's down now to 100. And um, Elon Musk says he's going to get under 100. The first companies are getting under 100. But that's still really expensive by conventional standards to produce baseload power, which could replace coal, gas, and oil. Solar. So when I started in the solar business uh, 10 years ago, solar was, let's say, 15 cents a kilowatt hour of capacity to uh, install, including the, not only the panels, but the rest of the plant. It went down to, it went down to 10 cents, and, um, and now it's down to maybe 5 cents. So we're getting lower and lower. You can buy the panels for about five cents. You've got to put a little bit of extra in there, and that runs it up to maybe um, uh, 10 cents. But you get an incentive. So when I ask Dominion Power, how much would they pay wholesale for green energy, they told me they would pay three cents a kilowatt hour. And um, that's, they want a markup. Of course, they're going to charge their customers more than that. But three cents a kilowatt hour is slightly below what you can do solar for right now without incentives. So we're not quite there. We don't know what to use all the carbon dioxide for. We know we're putting it up in power stacks, but in smokestacks, but what are we doing with it? So we can capture it, but what do we do with it? You can use some of it in, in beverages. Uh, but, but you have to clean it up. You have to take all the impurities out of it. Okay, we're doing that now. But how many carbonated beverages can you drink? You can liquefy it and pump it underground. But if it leaks out and comes up, it's poisonous. It's heavier than air. And so if it sits on a low ground, it, it, it could kill people. So we don't know what to do with carbon dioxide. And then there's a technology that might be able to broadcast power, so you wouldn't have transmission lines. There's a group in Texas that went back to Tesla and found that the equations that Tesla had worked out were correct, the subsequent efforts were wrong, and that if you do it right, you could take a solar energy from Saudi Arabia and broadcast it all over the world. And you could be 100% renewable with solar plants at various places around the globe. You wouldn't even have to store the power. You just lay it out and broadcast it. We're not there yet. And we don't know how to take the carbon dioxide out of the air. Ultimately, if you're going to try to preserve the Earth the way we see it today, it's not enough to simply stop emitting 
you've got to extract and the extraction is expensive and we don't quite have the technologies for it we're getting close any of these can be fixed it's just a matter of national will money and leadership but the technology is not quite there so if we want to take action what do we need to do look you have to put a price on carbon how you put that price on and what you do with the money that you take in that's the big questions but let's say you put a price of fifty dollars a ton on carbon that comes out to be about twenty five cents per gallon of gasoline people can pay that but will it change their behavior will it drive um, gasoline powered cars off the road no so you need an escalating price on carbon you start at fifty dollars but you project out in five years the price might be a hundred dollars in ten years the price might be five hundred dollars so you tell the manufacturers and the consumers get off carbon based transportation and here's the timeline and you can lay out the economic projections that will um, encourage you to do so and you collect tax revenues on it you can either distribute these to the people who are impacted by the rising prices like um, the people in my state who have to drive 30 miles every day to get a job uh, with a with a timber manufacturer company or uh, a wood cutting area or you can use it to reduce the deficit we need investment funds because the private sector is we love the private sector but I'm a banker I can tell you people are risk averse and after 2008 they're even more risk averse Lord Keynes who was the founder of macroeconomics asked the question why do people invest and honestly there's no answer he called it animal spirits but what I found after 2008 when I go to these business conferences and I see my friends I asked the guy who's worth a um, hundred million dollars I said uh, what are you working on now he says you know he said I'm just um, I'm pretty happy where I am and uh, you know I've got uh, I've got the house in Mexico and uh, and we're looking after the grandkids and I mean he's not investing in taking risks he's not creating jobs for the rest of us at least not directly and I asked my friend who's worth a couple of billion dollars I said what are you working on now and he said you know he said I've got the yacht off the coast of Mexico and um, you know I'm just sort of restructuring things for the for my family and um, I, I'm looking at things and uh, some things look pretty interesting but um, and so it that that's the animal spirits that are out there in too much of the business community right now so the only way you can replace that is with government leadership all the great things that have been done in this country they were actually done and led by the government they may have been done for private profit but they were led by the government the Erie Canal the transcontinental railroad the Panama Canal the space program the interstate highway system in no case did a group of entrepreneurs get together and say hey let's build the interstate highway system no it was a dream that Ike pushed in 1955 that came from a study done during World War II that showed that you needed these highways for national security purposes so we need international mobilization and we need government leadership there's a lot of talk today about the Green New Deal, and I love the concept. We need it. Um, the things that are laid out, if you've read it, it's, um, it's a little too visionary to be actually uh, practicable. You can't replace air travel in 10 years. You can't build the trains that you need in 10 years. You can't get all carbon fuel vehicles off the road in 10 years. You just can't do it. But you can certainly set up a structure and an incentive to move us that way in 15 years or 20 years. And we need to do that. So um, I like the, the idea of the Green New Deal. We have to get carbon negative. It's not enough to have efficiency. It's not enough to sustain what we have. We have to go beyond that to pull carbon out of the atmosphere if we're going to preserve some semblance of what we have today in terms of rainfall patterns and shorelines and agriculture 
and, uh, and, and glaciers, et cetera. Next. Nope, I've got to do this. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I've tried to do is give you um, a picture of the data. And here's the way you have to think about it, I think. So, if you look at this beautiful city of Las Vegas and where we are today, and um, this nice auditorium, um, it's built with fabric and steel and wood, and uh, that screen and the glass, that's the result of 7,000 years of human endeavor since the dawn of agriculture. During that period, maybe three billion people have lived and died on this planet. There'd been war and disease. There'd been empires that formed and collapsed. And about 200 years ago, mankind suddenly discovered how to take energy more effectively from the earth in the start of the industrial age. And it was coal, and it was England, and it was a steam engine that could use that coal, and it spread throughout the whole world. We have taken that energy and built this civilization from it. And the price that's being paid is the carbonization of the atmosphere and climate change. We're like the butterfly coming out of the cocoon, eating up the cocoon to get free. Except we have the smarts and the know-how and the conscience to know that we have to sustain and protect this earth because this is where we live. So we love civilization, but we've got to change the way we're approaching our economic endeavors. This is the greatest economic opportunity of our lifetimes. We have an imminent, immediate challenge. We almost have the technologies to meet it. It means new power generation, new automobiles, improved buildings. It means a new way of looking at mankind. All that's investment. Some people would tell you it's too costly. But what's one person's costs, that's another person's income. This is the way mankind can pull together and face the 21st century in a socially responsible, sustainable way. I've given you the challenge. The question is, can we meet it? If we all do our part, and if we demand that government do its part, the answer is yes. Thank you.